Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Uh, welcome to the session on the strategic outlook uh, for ASEAN. It's my pleasure uh, to be your moderator today. I'm uh, Mari Pangestu. Uh, I'm a professor of economics at the University of uh, Indonesia. Uh, and I guess a long time ASEANist. Uh, my friend over here, Tony, is smiling. <laughs> Uh, and I would like to now uh, introduce to you our very uh, excellent panel to address this topic. Uh, to my left is uh, my good friend, uh, Nazir. Uh, Dato Sri Nazir Razak is the chairman of CIMB Group Holdings, which is one of the largest financial servi service providers, not just in Malaysia, but, all, not, uh, but in ASEAN. Uh, and next to him is His Excellency Deputy Prime Minister Vuong Dinh Hue uh, from Vietnam. Uh, who is in charge of international economic integration, finance, and uh, economic issues uh, in general. And then to his left is uh, Anne Bridget Albertson, someone with a long experience in international development and human rights in the human system, uh, UN system, and currently the CEO of Plan International, which is an independent child rights and gender equality for girls uh, organization. Uh, and last but not least, we have Sigve Breke, president and CEO of Telenor Group, a major mobile operator in the world and who has been very instrumental in Telenor's growth uh, in Asia. Uh, let me begin by uh, quickly introducing the topic. Uh, three, just three points. I think ASEAN has celebrated its 50th anniversary last year, and I think everybody agrees that this has been a remarkable achievement. We've achieved peace and stability in the region, and the peace dividend has allowed economic prosperity and well-being. And if ASEAN was treated as a country with 639 million people, uh, it would be the seventh largest uh, economy in the world. Uh, second, uh, ASEAN countries and the way we have done cooperation has actually shown a lot of resilience, despite ups and downs, both economic crisis and political transitions. Somehow we've been able to come out of it. Even uh, the, the Asian financial crisis, uh, we, we were able to come out of it. So we are resilient. Uh, and moving forward, uh, what is the strategic outlook for ASEAN? This is the topic that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, given the leadership transition and regime change in some ASEAN countries, as well as the consolidation of democracy in others and growing geopolitical security issues. Second, given the need of structural reforms in the face of growing concerns about the fractured world, which is uh, what the forum today is, uh, World Economic Forum is focusing on today, about uh, retreat from globalization, questioning of the spread of globalization and so on. And uh, I would add demographic changes in ASEAN. And third, of course, the technological disruption, which is, again, a big topic, uh, not just in this uh, WEF, but in the past WEF. Now, before we begin our discussion with the panelists, I would like to give the uh, opportunity for uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tarman uh, Shamugaratnam, Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic and Social Policies of uh, Republic of Singapore, to make introductory remarks on the topic. And if you wish, you may want to also comment on some ideas about how ASEAN uh, can address some of these challenges, as Singapore is the chair of ASEAN this year. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Mari. And uh, I should just say that Ibu Mari was a little modest in her introduction of herself, because she actually knows more about ASEAN than anyone else in the room. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to just uh, spend three minutes uh, to say a few words uh, in the position of um, uh, being the ASEAN Chair Singapore. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here together with Deputy Prime Minister Hui and the rest of the panel. Uh, what Ibu Mari just said about the global challenges, uh, the shifts in the geostrategic balance, the uncertainties over uh, openness in trade and globalization, and I should add a third very important global challenge that's on all our minds now, which is the uh, more nameless, faceless challenges that we face in cybersecurity and terrorism. Uh, these weigh very much on our minds, but in ASEAN, we also see opportunity uh, in some of these challenges. Uh, frankly, the shift in economic balance globally is playing to ASEAN's favor. The rise of China and India is a huge opportunity for ASEAN. And in particular, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, has ASEAN as a core part of that initiative, and I would say an anchor uh, uh, along that initiative. So there's a lot of opportunity coming out of the shift in geostrategic balance. The 
main emphasis of uh, Singapore's uh, year as chair, which we have, and we, I say when I say main emphasis, I have to emphasize that we've developed this in consultation with our partners in ASEAN, uh, is twofold. First, resilience, and second, innovation. Resilience, especially in regard, with regard to these new 21st century uh, challenges of cybersecurity and terrorism. And we intend with our partners to develop further collective mechanisms uh, to tackle these two challenges in ASEAN. A second innovation, uh, if you, you know, be th for those of us who've been around for a while, uh, looking at economic policy, especially in ASEAN, ASEAN has really progressed through several stages of development. It started off as principally a commodity exporter to the world. It moved on to develop highly competitive export manufacturing industries, and now in some areas, export of services. We moved on to become a large middle class market. And what Ibu Mari said about become, being the seventh largest economy in the world, uh, which incidentally, by most projections, will become the fifth largest by 2020, is principally about the opportunities of a middle class consumption market. And that's the third phase. But we're now also entering a fourth phase, which is about innovation. And it doesn't substitute for the other phases. We are still a major commodity exporter. We are still highly competitive in export manufacturing. And we are still a very attractive market, both for goods and services. But innovation is now being, is now being breathed into all the existing dimensions of economic activity. And we see significant scope to embark now on a set of tracks, a set of streams of collaboration that advance innovation in ASEAN. So when we think of ASEAN, we think of it as an innovative region in the world. And I'll just mention very briefly, without getting into details, some of those streams of innovation that we are, we are pursuing together with our partners. And these are multi-year streams. It's not a one-off job, it's not a one-year job. First, use of financial technology. ASEAN is a very diverse region. There are still large, underserved uh, uh, populations uh, not without banking accounts or not adequately accessing financial services. And the opportunity to use fintech together with ex existing ASEAN players, existing financial f institutions, is a very significant one. Secondly, connecting digital payment systems. Uh, we already have some experiments that are underway. In fact, Thailand and Singapore have just started uh, detailed discussions on linking up our payment systems so that with just mobile phone numbers, you can make payments across countries. And we intend to spread that around ASEAN. Thirdly, in e-commerce, developing trade rules for e-commerce is very important. It's a huge potential market, but the aim basically is to lower the cost for consumers and to improve access for businesses. And this is on top of the existing initiatives to do with a single window, uh, which is still a very important project in ASEAN. But developing the trade rules for e-commerce within ASEAN is an important third priority. And fourthly, smart cities. Not just a buzzword, we, we intend to have designated smart cities across ASEAN and to engage in experiments that are unique to the ASEAN context, particularly in urbanization smart urbanization. There's a lot of sharing that is possible here, and we intend to do this in collaboration with the private sector, where there's a lot of expertise, a lot of ways of borrowing from what's going on around the world. And I'll just say very f finally that we're not going about this as sagely experts and you know, uh, high-level government people. We intend to involve the youth especially, because developing a workforce that is very comfortable with innovation, uh, that feels that innovation gives them advantage, is going to be critical. And whichever the stage of development at ASEAN, uh, we have that ability to get our youth interested in innovation. In fact, they'll do it probably a little faster than the rest of the population. So once again, thanks very much, Ibu Mari, for letting me say a few words. And I look forward to listening to the panelists. <coughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I think you've uh, shown that uh, Singapore has identified many of these strategic issues that hopefully will be uh, part of the ASEAN agenda this year. Now let me uh, turn to the panelists. I will not do it in the order of seating, but uh, I'll start with, oh, I should tell you that uh, there is a simultaneous translation. Uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese is channel two and English is channel one. Uh, let me ask, uh, let me start with uh, His Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam, uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Hue. Uh, 
Vietnam has been one of the rising stars in ASEAN and has done, has done major reforms as it joined the WTO and prepared itself for the TPP. Uh, what do you see as the major challenges for Vietnam uh, in continuing uh, its growth and development and resilience in terms of the structural reforms that will be needed? I think we are entering into the more difficult structural reforms like labor, like state-owned enterprises, uh, and so on. Uh, so I just wonder if you could uh, uh, highlight some of the challenges in the structural reform agenda uh, of Vietnam. Yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, xin, uh, cảm ơn, uh, bà Mary. Câu hỏi của bà thì rất là dài Để trả lời ngắn thì chắc là không dễ <cười> Tôi cũng rất là chia sẻ với những ý kiến của Ngài Tham An Phó Thủ tướng Singapore Đúng là đối với ASEAN thì Hòa bình, ổn định và hợp tác phát triển Thì vẫn là xu hướng chủ đạo là dòng chảy chính Nhưng mà như Ngài Tham An nói Thì chúng ta cũng phải đối mặt với những cái bất ổn Hiện nay đang xảy ra về căng thẳng địa chính trị, tình hình như là hạt nhân của bán đảo Triều Tiên, rồi tình hình Biển Đông, rồi đâu đó cũng đã có chủ nghĩa khủng bố, rồi ly khai. Thì chúng ta cũng còn đối mặt với các cái thách thức về biến đổi khí hậu và cái uh, uh, chủ nghĩa bảo hộ cũng như là cái chủ nghĩa dân túy và cái uh, chống lại cái tự do hóa thương mại thì cũng đe dọa cái sự phát triển của các nước ASEAN. Trong đó có Việt Nam uh, khi mà chúng ta là những nền kinh tế mà dựa nhiều vào xuất khẩu. Tôi cũng thông báo với quý vị là cuối năm ngoái thì tổng cái lượng xuất khẩu, nhập khẩu của Việt Nam thì đã đạt lại đến 193% GDP. Cho nên là bất cứ một cái thay đổi nào trong cái khu vực của thế giới thì đều có ảnh hưởng một cách nhanh chóng và trực tiếp đến nền kinh tế Việt Nam cả về thương mại, đầu tư cũng như là vấn đề tài chính và về tiền tệ. Và chị Mary thì có nói là Việt Nam đang như một ngôi sao đang lên nhưng mà không biết có phải là một ngôi sao hay không nhưng chắc chắn là quốc kỳ Việt Nam thì có một ngôi sao vàng. Và tôi cũng xin báo tin vui quý vị là ngôi sao vàng đó hiện nay đang thẳng tiến vào trận chung kết của giải bóng đá U23 quốc của châu Á. Và sẽ trận chung kết này sẽ ra vào ngày 27. <cười> <cười> Đây là cái điều mà chưa từng có mà Việt Nam đã đã làm được. Và để đối mặt với những cái thách thức đó thì Việt Nam đang cải tổ sâu rộng cái nền kinh tế của chúng tôi. Một mặt thì chúng tôi đẩy mạnh các cái hội nhập và kinh tế quốc tế. Lấy cái, cái kinh tế nội khối của ASEAN cộng đồng kinh tế ASEAN làm nền tảng với các cái cơ chế hợp tác ASEAN cộng à, hiện nay và cũng đang điều mà đàm phán cái hiệp định ASEAN và trong năm nay thì chúng tôi cũng sẽ dự kiến sẽ kết thúc các cái đàm phán CPTPP để rồi ký hiệp định giữa Việt Nam với Liên minh Châu Âu và trong ngày hôm qua chúng tôi đã đạt được thỏa thuận với thụy sĩ và Na Uy sẽ sớm ký cái FTA giữa Việt Nam với khối EFTA trong đó là thụy sĩ và Na Uy có vai trò dẫn dắt như vậy 2018 dự kiến là một cái năm bùng đỏ về 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 hội nhập kinh tế quốc tế của Việt Nam và chúng tôi lấy cái các cái tiêu chuẩn các cái cam kết quốc tế để tạo ra cái động lực cũng như sức ép trong cải cách trong nước hiện nay thì Việt Nam đang chủ trương để mạnh xây dựng một nền kinh tế thị trường với các cái tiêu chuẩn quản trị hiện đại hội nhập quốc tế trong đó thì lấy cái ổn định kinh tế vĩ mô làm nền tảng như chúng tôi đã nói quý vị thì bất cứ một cái tác động nào cũng sẽ ảnh hưởng đến Việt Nam vì vậy chúng tôi còn phải gia tăng củng cố thêm cái nền tảng của kinh tế vĩ mô rồi gia tăng cái đội chống chịu của hệ thống tài chính và ngân hàng đồng thời sẽ tiến hành cải cách các cái khu vực kinh tế trong nước một cách sâu rộng hơn dựa trên các cái trọng điểm như là về đầu tư công về hệ thống tài chính ngân hàng về lĩnh vực doanh nghiệp nhà nước cũng như các cái lĩnh vực như là tái cơ cấu đầu tư công à, tái cơ cấu thu chi ngân sách và đảm bảo bền vững an toàn của nợ công cũng như là tái cơ cấu mạnh mẽ cái khu vực sự nghiệp công theo cái nguyên tắc là là đơn vị công nhưng mà áp dụng cái, cái nguyên tắc quản trị tư à, áp dụng các cái công nguyên tắc công khai minh bạch trong cái quản trị các cái khu vực này à, đồng thời Việt Nam cũng đẩy mạnh thực hiện năm cái ba cái trụ cột trong cái, cái 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 vấn đề chiến lược của chúng tôi đó là đấu đẩy mạnh cái đầu tư xây dựng kết cấu hạ tầng à, kinh tế xã hội thứ hai là phát triển mạnh mẽ cái nguồn nhân lực nhất là trong cái điều kiện mà nhân lực chất lượng cao của cái cách mạng muốn sông không mà chúng ta cần phải phải đối mặt kể cả lao động dạy nghề cũng như giáo dục và đại học và chúng tôi cũng đẩy mạnh cái cải cách về thể chế trong đó lấy cái khu vực kinh tế tư nhân làm cái động lực chính cho cái phát triển của nền kinh tế và tôi xin thông báo với quý vị 2017 là một cái năm mà bùng nổ về cái start up cũng như là phát triển doanh nghiệp ở Việt Nam số lượng doanh nghiệp của chúng tôi trong năm 2017 thì thành lập mới là khoảng 130.000 
tức là bằng khoảng 20% tổng số doanh nghiệp mà từ khi thành lập nước đến nay chúng tôi đã có. Và con số này chúng tôi sẽ tiến tới là 1 triệu vào năm 2020. Đây là động lực chính cho cải cách của Việt Nam. Về vấn đề dân số thì tôi cũng xin thông báo với quý vị là Việt Nam thì chúng tôi đang đối mặt nguy cơ là chưa giàu mà đã già. Chúng tôi chưa tận dụng xong cái cơ hội của dân số vàng. Thì tới đây thì chúng tôi phải đối mặt với một cái thách thức. Việt Nam là một trong những nước mà có tốc độ già hóa nhanh nhất ở khu vực châu Á này. Vì vậy tôi xin thông báo quý vị là Việt Nam đã chuyển trọng tâm chính sách về dân số của chúng tôi. Chúng tôi đang chuyển cái trọng tâm chính sách từ cái kiểm soát cái số lượng sinh mà sang cái trọng tâm là dân số với cái phát triển bền vững lấy cái duy trì cái tỷ lệ sinh hợp lý như người như tôi đáng lẽ cũng được phân bổ thêm mấy cái chỉ tiêu trước đây chúng tôi chỉ được đẻ mỗi gia đình thì chỉ có hai con thôi và thay cho cái kiểm soát thì cái số dưỡng sinh thì chúng tôi chuyển sang áp dụng cái chính sách là duy trì cái tỷ lệ sinh thay thế hợp lý hiện nay thành phố hồ chí minh đã xuống dưới hai rồi và nguy cơ này thì nếu như cái tiếp tục mà xuống mãi thì dân số sẽ bước vào cái thời gian già hóa rất là nhanh chóng đồng thời cũng với cái việc kiểm soát cái duy trì cái tốc độ và cái tỷ lệ về thay sĩ tỷ lệ sinh thế thì chúng tôi đang đẩy mạnh các cái chương trình để mà nâng cao chất lượng dân số của Việt Nam để đáp ứng với cái thời kỳ mới nhất là trong công nghiệp 4.0 xin chào tất cả quý vị. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your remarks and outlining the structural reforms uh, from Vietnam. I think the main point about the importance of uh, inter uh, regional integration uh, and its impact on shaping reforms. Uh, and I think that's a very important point given the lack of movement in the multilateral uh, agenda as well as uh, other uh, anti-globalization uh, uh, retreat from globalization, which leads me into the question for Anne. Uh, I think the retreat from globalization, as we know, uh, has, been, uh, has happened because of this kind of lack of inclusiveness that has happened and the lack of uh, uh, the perception that the benefits of globalization has not been uh, spread uh, as much as it should be. So given your experience on, uh, on, uh, on uh, international development and inclusiveness, uh, how can ASEAN, what should ASEAN uh, do, what should ASEAN learn from this in ensuring that we can uh, achieve uh, opening up, uh, liberalization, growing and integrating, but uh, making sure that it's inclusive, especially for uh, gender equality and the youth, as Deputy Tharman uh, mentioned. Well, thank you, Ibo Mari, and, and thanks for, for letting me participate in this, in this uh, panel. The um, Plan International is working in seven out of the 10 ASEAN countries and have done so for many, many decades now. Um, we're deeply embedded in communities, um, some of the most poor and vulnerable, and experience on a daily basis some of the inequalities that's, that persist in ASEAN. When that is said, I have to say that um, we've also seen tremendous benefits of the economic growth uh, reach those communities through better healthcare, better education systems. But I'd like to focus some of my comments on, on some of the potential missed opportunities because the, the, the acceleration in growth um, in, 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 in ASEAN will only come with true focus on the participation of women in the labor force. And here, again, progress has been seen. We've got massive um, um, increase both in, in female entrepreneurship, in, in women entering the workforce, uh, very, very good um, progress on education. Um, in many ASEAN countries today, we've got basic parity in, in graduation at, at tertiary level from university. But then what happens? We've got all these fantastic, well-educated women that don't necessarily end up in the workforce. Um, they're held back from the workforce by um, some fairly um, entrenched social norms and a sense that the female should still be the primary caregiver. Um, that's a very, very hard barrier to overcome. Um, now, it's obviously not just a social issue. It is, as many of you know, an economic um, issue. WEF itself has said that we're talking about significant losses in GDP, 10%, up to 20% in ASEAN countries through this waste of human capital that is not fully included in the, in the workforce. Um, Deputy Prime Minister, you talked about the, the innovation and, and technology and seizing that. And what we're also seeing is that, that uh, girls, young girls and, and women in ASEAN are also falling back in terms of digital literacy. Mm -hmm. um, if 
uh, countries were to focus on increasing digital literacy for, for girls and women, we would be looking at empowering up to 20 million uh, women and adding $2 trillion uh, to the economy. Some, some, some basic um, opportunities that are not currently being seized. Um, let me just move a little bit to youth before, before I end. Um, we're obviously also seeing that, that if we look at the relatively low unemployment rates um, in ASEAN, we're still looking at youth unemployment being five times higher than adult unemployment. Mm. And, and when we look at political stability, when we look at engagement and inclusion, we've got to find ways of, of activating um, and getting, the, getting youth quicker into the workforce. So Plan International in, in ASEAN is very much working with governments, with uh, corporates, to, to accelerate the skills development and to make sure that that skills development is truly demand driven so that it's, we're working with corporates to identify what are the demands for skills that you need. Um, and let me finish in terms of inclusion. We've got to make sure that the education systems are really driven by the demands of the private and the public sector of the future because the gap that exists there means that um, a lot of young uh, boys and girls drop out of, this, of the education system because they can't see that it's really going to give them the jobs and the skills that are needed for the future. And that dropout rate is something that we need to be focusing on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, lots of challenges there. I think the last one is very important. It's about education and training for the future, the jobs of the future. Uh, and I, I think that will be also one of the themes uh, for the Singapore year. Uh, now let me turn to uh, uh, my friend Razak here. Uh, I think given the challenges that we're having and the transitions we're having, political, institutional, as well as economic uh, in ASEAN, uh, in, you know, including the technological disruptions, obviously, how do you, how do you think uh, from a business perspective, national governments, how, what should national governments do? And uh, what should ASEAN do to make sure that uh, we are going to be continuing to be resilient uh, facing all these challenges. Okay, thank you, uh, Ibu Mari, and uh, thank you for that huge question. Um, <laughs> I think let me just um, maybe focus on three points. Uh, firstly, in terms of politics across the region, um, as you know, this is a, actually a very big uh, political year. Mm -hmm. uh, we expect or we will have elections in Cambodia, uh, in Malaysia, uh, most likely uh, Thailand, uh, and of course, in Indonesia, uh, pretty much the, the beginning of the presidential elections and, and regional mm -hmm. elections. Uh, from a business standpoint, uh, I think what we're looking for is, of course, continued peace and stability, uh, but also uh, progress uh, towards more sustainable political systems uh, in the region. Uh, and you know, I'm really hopeful uh, that Indonesia, which has become a beacon of um, a plural democratic uh, system um, in, in recent years, I'm really hopeful that those gains we made are sustained through this next round mm. uh, of uh, elections, uh, despite you know, pressures that are coming from uh, global rise in identity politics, uh, populism, uh, and of course, uh, religion uh, in politics. Um, the second uh, area is in terms of uh, national policies. Uh, I think I totally agree uh, with what Anne said about the importance of education, uh, youth, and bringing back uh, women. Uh, but let me make uh, another three uh, points. Um, one is I think um, given uh, the fourth industrial revolution, technology, etc., I think it's time to, for many governments to relook uh, at uh, national policies. Uh, and one area I think we need to look at is uh, this tension uh, between um, rising or the need to grow, uh, uh, in enable entrepreneurs uh, versus vested interests uh, and how uh, in ASEAN there is a tendency for them to quite effectively protect themselves. Um, yet we need uh, to, to, to enable these, these smaller, um, newer, more innovative, uh, highly charged companies uh, to evolve. Two is, uh, I have noticed in, in recent times, a more active state uh, in many ASEAN countries mm. uh, in business. Uh, and I think we need to look at that carefully. 
Uh, I don't disagree uh, with the need of um, 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 government companies uh, and so on in the economy, uh, but I think we need to get the balance right um, uh, with uh, uh, private enterprise. Uh, and the third point is, um, I think in many countries, um, we are not um, achieving potential because of a lack of legal certainty. Uh, I think in many countries, uh, investors, both local and foreign, um, as well as lenders, uh, banks like us, uh, struggle uh, uh, with this whole issue of legal certainty. Uh, the legal reforms uh, in many countries uh, need that. I truly believe uh, in Indonesia uh, in particular, uh, Indonesia is doing well, but it can do fantastically well uh, if this issue of uh, legal certainty uh, is, is, is addressed. And the final point is um, on your question about what can ASEAN do. I mean, with I, I totally uh, um, support uh, the areas of focus that uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tarman uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, vis the fourth industrial revolution. Um, but, um, you know, I think we have to be honest that um, when it comes to uh, the economy, um, the ASEAN economic community, for instance, ha ASEAN has fallen short. Uh, and one of the reasons ASEAN has fallen short is arguably the ASEAN way, mm. right? Uh, which, you know, has its advantages, but when it comes to economy, uh, has had uh, its limitations. And today, uh, businesses are faced with the fourth industrial revolution. What are the key drivers of success uh, in this new era? Well, one is data, right? How are we addressing data flows between ASEAN countries? Um, two is economies of scale. Uh, if we don't deliver the 650 million potential to our businesses, right? Uh, we're going to be invaded by global platform companies, etc. Uh, if you look at what Ali and Tencent have in China, it's one and a half billion people uh, market to, inv uh, to, to innovate uh, and invest. And ASEAN needs to deliver that for its people. And my argument is that perhaps the only way is to really be a little bit more aggressive uh, and relook at the ASEAN way and the pace uh, of integration, which didn't deliver the AEC as promised, uh, and I fear may not deliver uh, the level of integration we need for the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, uh, I think I see uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tarman taking careful note there. Uh, I think these are uh, big challenges for us in terms of the ASEAN uh, agenda, uh, and, but I hope that uh, with the challenge, sometimes a crisis helps you to focus, right? And maybe the fourth industrial revolution is not a crisis, but if we don't deal with it, uh, certainly we are going to be left behind because the regional value chain or global value chain has totally changed. Uh, and we have to take note that ASEAN has become a consumer market, as you were saying, uh, with the e-commerce platforms. And ASEAN is big enough to have the scale uh, to compete, I guess, with the Alibabas uh, of the world. But as you, somebody who's actually have a cooperation with Alibaba, right? Yeah, how do you cooperate, but at the same time, make sure that the ASEAN uh, market, the ASEAN companies are going to be participating uh, in this new uh, model? So uh, let me uh, now turn to the last panelist, uh, uh, and uh, Zikwe Brecker. I think you, you can certainly be uh, competent to talk about uh, the mobile penetration rate and the connectivity that's happening in ASEAN now. I think what we're seeing is that there's a very uh, exponential rise of uh, mobile penetration rate in ASEAN. You can see Myanmar you know, going from nothing to really having uh, incredible connectivity in a very short peri period of time. How do you see the opportunities, uh, including the potential for countries to leapfrog using these new technologies and business model? Uh, and how do you see also the downside risks such as cybersecurity, uh, loss of jobs uh, and inclusiveness. And in particular, how do you think mobile connectivity can play a role in the digital society uh, and economy of ASEAN? And I'm going to do that in two minutes. <laughs> well, th thanks for the question and so thanks for having me on, on the panel. Um, I'm representing Telenor, uh, global uh, mobile operator uh, based in Norway, but operating in several markets in both Europe and Asia. 180 million customers, so we are one of the biggest. And in ASEAN, we are in the three markets, Myanmar, Thailand, and Malaysia, and have been that actually for the last uh, 18 years. So, and I have been fortunate enough also to live in ASEAN myself, both in Singapore and in, and in Thailand for the last 15 years. Uh, that answers your question. 
I think that the growth you have seen in ASEAN the last uh, uh, five to ten years has very much been driven actually by connectivity, uh, connecting people to, uh, to uh, connectivity services, communication services. And the best example of that is, uh, it's, as you mentioned, Myanmar. Three years ago, uh, Myanmar had a uh, um, penetration of uh, communication penetration of less than 10% and almost zero internet penetration. Three years thereafter, meaning today, uh, the mobile penetration is now 60% in three years. Mm -hmm. And 60% of those uh, are using internet, advanced internet users. Think about that leapfrog. In three years, they have done what other countries took 15 years to do. Mm -hmm. And I think this is just to start. And then we talk about the digital uh, economy and the, the fourth uh, uh, in the industrial revolution. I think that's very much going to be driven uh, with continuous connectivity. And now it's not only people-to-people uh, -people connectivity, it's also Internet of Things, uh, which will uh, be also an uh, important part of that. And I think that uh, to, to do that, uh, it will be about broadband access to the people, to the masses. It will be uh, about taking, also making services, uh, production of services, uh, and, and work more efficient with, uh, with technology. And it will be about uh, a new type of digital services. Uh, we have mentioned Alibaba, Tencent, also e-commerce, financial services, health services, educational services. I have four, what should I say, wishes. Uh, that I hope the ASEAN community could look at to make that digital economy growing. The first one, it's about uh, broadband access. If you really want to uh, make broadband access for everyone out in the remote villages in, uh, in Indonesia or in Myanmar or even in Thailand, uh, it is about that's going to happen through wireless uh, broadband access, not fixed. Uh, and you need to let then the mobile operators have uh, terms, conditions, uh, regulations that are favorable. We are spending a lot of money building these networks, and then we move into 5G is another round of significant investments. So we need regulations which are predictable. We re uh, need regulations which are fair uh, and a level playing field. Uh, and But we also need regulations uh, which is um, a cooperation between ourselves and the government. We don't want only the government to charge us upfront in very expensive auctions and then leave it to us how we deploy the services. We would like rather to have a cooperation where we commit to what type of services that we should roll out, uh, the coverage obligation that we should have, and with that also find more reasonable investment framework. So that's one. The second one, it's uh, a liberalization of the banking sector. If you want to have full financial inclusion in these markets, you will not be able to do that through traditional banks. You need to let new players come in. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, going quite slow in most of the ASEAN markets. The banking regulations are still, uh, in my view, for the past, not for the future. So let companies like the mobile operators or others come in and get uh, access to, to, uh, to digital uh, uh, financial uh, um, uh, platforms also allowing us to do that uh, because if we do you can get an inclusion also with the ones that never will have a bank account because there is basically no branches out there but in addition to that you need to harmonize also financial uh, system across ASEAN it need to be easier to send money across the countries uh, because if you really want to take position in these uh, areas uh, that that's that's important the third area it's um, uh, harmonization of import duties I think this is the biggest uh, obstacle that e-commerce have today, to send goods uh, from a country to, to another country. Uh, and again, you should be looking at ASEAN as one market there, like, like they do in the European Union. Uh, and the last one uh, is what is already mentioned, it's uh, uh, data flows. Uh, you need to allow uh, cross-border data uh, to happen. In addition to that, I think ASEAN should build a competence center on, on machine learning, artificial intelligence. <coughs> uh, China is coming out saying that uh, AI first, Google is saying AI first, and there's a lot of investments going now into how to use data uh, and, and machine learning to advance services. Do not let uh, uh, that competence be left to the Chinese or to Silicon Valley. ASEAN is big enough uh, in itself to have competence on this area.
Thank you very much. I think uh, I can. I see, see Deputy Tarman also taking note of your wish list. <laughs> and uh, I think this is a uh, very useful uh, input uh, directly from uh, the business perspective, both from uh, uh, from the both the both the last interventions from the business sector. Now it's uh, up to you, participants, to give more input. We have about 15 minutes uh, for you to raise your questions, comments, inputs. And if you have specific questions to specific panelists, please uh, specify which panelists you are asking the question to. And also please introduce yourself. So anybody would like to start the question? OK, over here. Please, Mike. Thank you. Stefan Flickiger, Swiss government. Um, very, very interesting. Um, uh, there's one thing I have not heard. Um, you were talking, the business community has been talking about the regulatory environment and stability. Um, I have not heard the C word. Is this um, because we're not supposed to mention it? Um, or is it not a problem? I'm talking about corruption. OK, the C word. Uh, any, uh, maybe the two business people can respond whether that's an issue or, or not an issue. Uh, yes, it is an issue, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and um, however, I think that this issue is becoming uh, more and more on the agenda for not only businesses, but also for policymakers. Uh, and I think that um, there are um, more and more, uh, what should I say, it? Uh, it's more and more visible now that if you want to, to have a credible long-term business in these markets, you have to stay clean. You have to do business the right way. Telenor as a group, we are very focused on that. Uh, and and uh, we are making our voice heard every time uh, we are uh, entering into either bidding processes or relationships with the government. So, so this is an issue that I think uh, continues to be on the agenda. and. Uh, on the ASEAN level, I would also love that the politicians are talking more about it because this, this is not only about fair and free competition. Uh, it, it's also about uh, making sure that you are taking away inefficiencies in the system. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I hope that we are making progress there. Uh, and, and, um, but having said that, uh, uh, things are going in the right direction in my view. When we entered Myanmar three years ago, this was a major concern. When I presented this to the board of Telenor three years ago, it was a major concern. So I'm impressed by the way the government have been handling it. So step by step, I think, uh, think uh, we are going in the right direction. That's a optimistic note. You, you mentioned legal certainty. Yeah, That's I mean, I think I didn't say the C word, but <laughs> I mentioned legal certainty. Uh, and I do think corruption uh, remains an issue. Uh, but I agree that uh, um, there is considerable progress. Uh, and in particular, I, 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 I like the example of Indonesia. Um, you know, compare the level of corruption when we first invested in the early 2000s uh, versus what it is today. Uh, and I think for business, um, legal certainty and the ability uh, to say no to corruption and, and, and actually report corruption uh, is uh, very important. Yeah, I think you know in Indonesia, I can I can recall the year when we can start saying the c word it was ninety six. Before that, we used the euphemism high cost economy. <laughs> <laughs> now you know, then we start being able to say it, and then of course we had democracy, and we we have an anti corruption court, we have a anti corruption, a very fierce independent anti corruption commission. But it's a process, you know, uh, eliminating corruption is a process, and it's awareness, and I think technology. Uh, with e you know e-governance uh, should uh, really help a lot incre with increasing transparency and I think this should again uh, be on the ASEAN uh, agenda. Uh, yes, over here. I think for the ASEAN countries there's another opportunity which is the sustainability agenda. Uh, if we look at uh, the past uh, communication, deforestation, palm oil, climate, I think a lot of negative news. I know that the, Viet the Vietnamese government and the Indonesian government has done a lot since then. And I think to be vocal and open about this, about the progress made, at the same time the challenges as well, I think that is an, uh, a good export uh, argument as well for countries who would like to, and companies like us, who would like to trade with, uh, with ASEAN as well. And I would not miss this on the agenda of uh, development uh, of the region, mm -hmm. the sustainability agenda, open, transparent, but also talking about progress and all the things which have been done in a positive sense. 
thank you for your comment. Would uh, the Deputy Prime Minister Hui and uh, Anne, would you like to comment on you know, further ideas, how we can <laughs> pursue the sustainability agenda in ASEAN? Prime Minister? Uh, tôi nghĩ rằng uh, phát triển bền vững uh, uh, theo cái chương trình nghị sự của Liên Hợp Quốc nó là thể hiện cái khát vọng của hoài bão của các nước và các cái quốc gia để chúng ta có một cái tăng trưởng nó đồng đều, nó bao trùm và nó mang lại cái lợi ích cho mọi người. Uh, theo cái phương châm là làm sao cho đất nước của mỗi đất nước của chúng ta thì tiến lên phía trước nhưng không có một ai bị bỏ lại ở phía sau. Thì về cái phát triển bền vững như vậy thì tôi nghĩ rằng là chúng ta phải tập trung cả các cái trụ cột về cả kinh tế, xã hội, cả về môi trường. Và chúng ta phải huy động rất nhiều các cái nguồn lực kể cả về nhân lực, về cả tài nguyên cũng như về cả các cái nguồn lực khác về tài chính để chúng ta đảm bảo cho một cái phát triển tăng trưởng, một cái tăng trưởng bao trùm. Ở Việt Nam hiện nay thì đang đối mặt với cái thách thức là làm sao mà phải phát triển nhanh hơn bởi vì nếu chúng tôi không phát triển nhanh thì chúng tôi sẽ ngày càng tụt hậu với khu vực và thế giới nhưng mà chúng tôi là phải phát triển bền vững hơn đó là một cái thách thức vô cùng lớn đặc biệt là trong cái bối cảnh mà kinh tế và chính trị thế giới đang có những cái dịch chuyển hết sức là quan trọng và trong cái thách thức của cái công nghiệp 4.0 nhân đây tôi cũng nói thêm về cái đại diện của chính phủ của Thủy Điển liên quan đến vấn đề tham nhũng và chống tham nhũng rất nhiều nhà đầu tư có hỏi tôi rằng là trong năm 2017 thì Việt Nam đã đẩy rất là mạnh cái chiến dịch đấu tranh chống tham nhũng. Chúng tôi đã xử lý rất nhiều các cái vụ án đại án về kinh tế, trong đó có những lãnh đạo ở cấp cao nhất, cấp cao nhất của quốc gia đã bị truy tố và xét xử ở tòa án. Thì điều đó nó có tác động gì đến cái việc mà cái lòng tin của người dân của các nhà đầu tư trong ngoài nước để đầu tư ở nước các bạn hay không? Thì tôi chỉ muốn nói như thế này, 2017 là chúng tôi đấu tranh rất là mạnh mẽ với phòng chống tham nhũng như vậy. Nhưng năm 2017 là một năm mà bùng nổ về phát triển doanh nghiệp của chúng tôi. Một cái năm mà chúng tôi thu hút được 30 tỷ đô la về FDI là năm mà có kỳ kỷ lục cao nhất từ trước đến nay. Và nhiều cái vụ thoái vốn cũng như bán vốn nhà nước, IPO doanh nghiệp nhà nước thì đã có hàng trăm, hàng ngàn các cái nhà đầu tư người ta tham gia điển hình một cái vụ bán vốn ở cái công ty bia rượu nước giải khát của chúng tôi là Sabeco, chúng tôi bán với một cái giá kỷ lục mới có một bán một nửa cái doanh nghiệp này chúng tôi đã thu về một cái cùng một lúc mà thu về đến 5 tỷ đô la Mỹ. Thì điều đó minh chứng cho cái việc là nếu chúng ta tạo ra một cái sự công khai và minh bạch với những cái nguyên tắc của thị trường trong một nền kinh tế thì chúng ta không những là làm cho nhà đầu tư trong nước nước ngoài mất tin tưởng chúng ta mà trái lại thì càng củng cố thêm trên cơ sở cái nền tảng ổn định chính trị và ổn định về kinh tế vĩ mô. Tôi xin nói thêm một số điểm như vậy. Thank you. Uh, Anne, would you like to? Thank you, Mary. If you permit me, I'll, I'll actually also comment on the, uh, on the corruption point because I noticed that you fielded it straight to private sector. Um, <laughs> but, but obviously, corruption in the public sector is, is, is an impediment to the social inclusion and for social services to actually reach uh, the, the beneficiaries. Um, and there, both, both the public at large and civil society can play a very, very important role in terms of both uh, monitoring the use of public fun funds, but also just through sheer transparency, knowing what is, is supposed to come to them, and they can then call out um, if they see uh, funds go awry. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the rule of law. Um, one of the biggest barriers to actually getting women into the workplace is that public transport is not safe. 35% of young women say that they don't believe that they can rely on the p police force in their, in their cities or communities mm -hmm. to do anything if they um, experience harassment. Those types of barriers to actually get mm -hmm. women and young, young girls out of, mm -hmm. out of the home and into the workplace mm -hmm. are key barriers that need to be addressed also through public policy and, and rule of law. And finally, on the sustainability issue, I'll, I think I'll go straight back to education. Um, we, you know, with a very, very strong education system that, that ASEAN has, I mean, that has to be the starting point for the engagement 
of, of children and young people into a completely different mind shift around the use of natural resources, the future sustainability of the planet, community resilience and their role in building that resilience is something that obviously has to come from the education system. Yeah, so starting at young yeah, in the curriculum, mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I think SDGs, SDGs is a good, um, you know, whatever we say about it, some 17 goals and 169 targets sounds like huge, but it, it's a way to focus uh, the agenda on very specific issues, I think, within ASEAN. I see two hands up, so let me give, can I give the lady first, if you don't mind? <laughs> Much. Uh, my name is Sona, and I'm a global shaper from Armenia, Yerevan Hub. Thank you very much for an interesting discussion. Um, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister mentioned the importance of uh, youth and the role that they can play uh, in the development of the region, and I really believe that, that, that this applies not only to ASEAN, but to all over the world, to all the countries. So I wonder, how do you empower and how do you involve the youth in the decision-making process? Thank you very much. In the decision-making process, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, perhaps all four of you can uh, care to comment on, on this very important question. Uh, and maybe you can start because this is certainly your <laughs> area of ex expertise and experience. S so, I mean, obviously I think even though youth engagement is at the very, very heart of, of everything that Plan International does, every single organization, be that public, private, or, or civil society, has to really begin to walk the talk. Um, I talked before about the need to, to you know, y youth involvement is, is good for sustainability, it's good for, for, for political engagement. It's actually good for designing education, public services, companies for the future in terms of the, the, the innovation and insights that they can bring. Most of us are struggling to do it right. Mm. Um, often it becomes quite tokenistic. Um, we might invite, in, invite a young person to come and sit with us and have a chat. Um, so it actually takes effort. It's not rocket mm. science. Mm. Um, as somebody said yesterday about gender equality, that's not rocket science either. That is attention science. So one actually has to decide to pay attention to it and design uh, decision-making processes in a way where there's real time for listening and engagement and dialogue mm -hmm. uh, with young people. So I'll leave you with that thought. Listening. And I think with uh, mobile connectivity, with social media, yeah. the youth can have, uh, you know, your voice can be heard. So maybe uh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very good question. Uh, I was thinking about three areas. Uh, the first one is uh, information. Uh, and I think just bringing information, bringing the world uh, into the villages, uh, into, into the hand of, of youths that uh, never knew what was actually happening uh, outside the, uh, the village before in some of the emerging markets in itself is important. Uh, and we see that that is actually driving internet access in, in the markets where we operate, just the hunger for information. The second one is education. And I hope that that broadband access uh, can can uh, allow everyone to get access to the same type of uh, um, education, that you don't have to travel to the cities to, to a university. And the third one, uh, which is quite interesting, it's startup community. In all the markets where we now see uh, where we operate, we see now that there's a lot of youth coming up with good ideas. And with uh, in the digital uh, revolution, it's uh, much easier, much cheaper, and much faster to actually g take an idea into practice. Uh, and we are sponsoring some of these good ideas uh, through our, our uh, startup programs. Uh, and I think uh, going forward, if the Asian uh, community do this right, you will see that Asia or ASEAN can really be a center of innovation driven by youth uh, ideas. Uh, tôi xin được uh, nói thêm uh, như thế này uh, ngoài uh, vấn đề uh, bình đẳng giới như uh, uh, bạn đã nói thì uh, vấn đề mà lôi cuốn uh, người trẻ uh, tham gia vào cái uh, các công việc của quốc gia thì uh, như chị đề cập thì uh, đúng là ngày càng quan trọng và tôi tán thành với ý kiến của các cái diễn giả ở đây uh, tôi chỉ muốn uh, uh, đồng ý là cần phải có thông tin cần phải có cơ chế tương tác để chúng ta phát huy uh, cái uh, 
tiềm năng và cái tài năng sáng tạo của tuổi trẻ nhưng ý mà tôi muốn nói một cái điều quan trọng nhất ấy, là vấn đề chính phủ ấy, cần phải đặt niềm tin vào cái người trẻ và giới trẻ thì chúng ta có thể hoàn toàn uh, sử dụng được cái cái vấn đề bình đẳng giới cũng như vấn đề uh, những cái cán bộ trẻ những cái tầng lớp doanh nhân trẻ uh, tham gia các hoạch định chính sách uh, đặc biệt như ở Việt Nam thì chúng tôi có những cái cơ chế thiết kế những hệ sinh thái khởi nghiệp mà dành riêng cho cái đổi mới sáng tạo nhất là đối với trong các cái uh, người đổi mới người, người khởi nghiệp đó là giới thanh niên thứ hai là chúng tôi cũng thành lập những cái hiệp hội doanh nghiệp trẻ ở các cái cấp độ trung ương cũng như khu vực và địa phương để người ta tham gia vào các cái vấn đề liên quan đến vấn đề kinh tế xã hội của đất nước. I, I would just add that you know from our business perspective as as a banker, I think engaging youth is about survival, uh, and if we leave the future of banking to all bankers, we're going to be in trouble. Um, so we have massive engagement uh, programs, and at the national level in Malaysia, uh, the government has a long-term um, transformation plan called TN50, uh, and at the heart of that is a massive um, youth engagement program across the nation, actually. I'm going to give you an Indonesian answer. Enter into politics. If you want to change and be part of the decision maker, be part of it. Yeah. And in Indonesia, we have a disruption even in the political parties. We have a new party uh, called PSI, uh, Partai Solidaritas Indonesia, Indonesia Solidarity Party. There's an age limit. You have to be below 45 years old uh, to be a member. Uh, they do. They use. It's the now party. They use now uh, m techniques, uh, crowdsourcing of uh, members, crowdsourcing of funding. Uh, all the potential members for legislative, uh, which will be uh, uh, finalized by August of this year, they are interviewed and the interview is all transparent. It's all uploaded in YouTube. And the uh, party uh, head of the party is only 32 years old mm -hmm. and the one of the party officials is only 21 years old. So that's uh, my answer <laughs> uh, to how the youth should be part of the Are decision. Are you a member of the party? I uh, know, but I'm, I'm a member of the sel uh, independent selection of the, uh, you know, the, the ones who interview. <laughs> so uh, I think one last question over here. I'm sorry. Uh, I think we only have time for one more question. Uh, thank you. My name is Michael Itzer from the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Could I thank the panel for some very interesting and relevant observations? My question is about corporate governance. How do the panel see the level of maturity of corporate governance across the ASEAN region? And if you think there's further development to be made, what would you, what would you do? Anybody want to tackle corporate governance? Nasir? I mean, I think the level, again, the improvement since the Asian financial crisis has been tremendous. Uh, my fear is that um, we may regress a little bit. Um, and here, um, I go back to my point earlier about the legal uh, certainties, right? Uh, and I think at some point, writing all the rules uh, is, is actually becomes the easy part. It's actually ensuring um, compliance that's, that's the tough part. Uh, yes. uh, tôi uh, mà nói một chút là về vấn đề quản trị uh, công ty và quản trị doanh nghiệp uh, cũng là một vấn đề mà chúng ta phải đặt ra uh, nhất là trong cái điều kiện mà những cái xảy ra những cái khủng hoảng uh, vừa rồi uh, những cái khủng hoảng tài chính và tiền tệ đã xảy ra từ 2008 uh, thì nó không xuất phát từ ở đâu hết mà xuất phát từ các cái doanh nghiệp thôi từ hệ thống ngân hàng thôi và thậm chí nó cũng xuất phát từ các cái doanh nghiệp mà của mọi thành phần kinh tế kể cả tư nhân vì vậy cho cái việc mà đảm bảo cái việc mà tăng cường cái khả năng uh, uh, quản trị của các cái công ty thì chúng tôi nghĩ đây là một điều hết sức là quan trọng thì uh, chính sách của Việt Nam của chúng tôi là các cái doanh nghiệp mà khi mà đã niêm yết thì dứt khoát là à, khi đã cổ phần hóa hay là có cái công ty đa sở hữu thì dứt khoát phải được niêm yết trên thị trường chứng khoán để đảm bảo cái tính minh bạch của nó để quản trị nó như với tư cách là một cái công ty niêm yết chúng ta phải công khai minh bạch các cái thông tin ra và phải áp dụng các cái tiêu chuẩn OECD trong cái quản trị của doanh nghiệp bất kể đó là doanh nghiệp tư nhân hay doanh nghiệp nhà nước thì chúng ta sẽ tăng cường được cái khả năng chống chịu của các cái doanh nghiệp trước các cái khủng hoảng và tôi cũng đồng ý với chị là Việt Nam hiện nay chúng tôi cũng đang thảo luận cái việc là cần phải mở rộng ra cái việc mà phòng chống tham nhũng trong cả cái khu vực tư bởi vì giữa khu vực công và tư thì nó cũng có một cái kết nối với nhau 
nếu mà chúng ta không có cái minh bạch cái quan hệ giữa khu vực công công tư cũng như là tăng cường cả cái quản trị khu vực công tư thì chúng ta cũng sẽ không có chống tham nhũng một cách thành công đâu. Okay, I think we've had a very rich discussion. We have uh, about six minutes left for the session. I would like to now turn to each of the panelists. I suppose it's a tall order. I've been asking you to, to do a tall order anyway, so you've performed wonderfully. So one minute each. <laughs> uh, uh, what is your uh, main recommendation for Deputy Prime Minister uh, of Singapore uh, for the ASEAN year? What, you know, uh, all of you had, w some of you had wish lists, but if you had to prioritize one or two recommendations uh, for the ASEAN year, uh, what would it be in terms of, you know, uh, dealing with the challenges that we, we are uh, facing in ASEAN? So who would like to go first? Start from that side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he already had his wish list. So you had a wish list. So out of the four wish lists, did you have one more? Did you want to prioritize out of your wish list? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have one more. One more. <laughs> uh, no, and that's very, very simple. That's a partnership. Uh, in a digital economy, a uh, partnership is going to be much more important than they have seen in the, part, uh, in the past. And that's partnership between government and businesses, it's partnership between big businesses and small businesses, mm -hmm. and it's partnership uh, across. Uh, and I think uh, ASEAN uh, need to get uh, their partnership in order, uh, seeing ASEAN as, as one region. Uh, and you are big enough to really make a difference in the world if you get, get the act together. And in, in addition to that, if uh, public uh, policy makers also can can uh, try to not only regulate, but also uh, uh, find business, uh, business government partnerships, that, that, uh, that would be my one wish. Okay. I think I'll build on that. Um, it will need public, private, and civil society partnerships to tackle the entrenched gender norms in ASEAN society. And it has to be tackled for the ASEAN region to unleash the power of, of girls and women and to have them be part of fueling the economy um, of the future. Uh, many companies in ASEAN, many governments are setting targets for parity, but not really setting targets for addressing social norms. And, and that needs to be very much part of the agenda. And then invest, invest, invest in digital literacy for girls. Thank you. Great recommendations. Prime Minister, here. Tôi thì có một cái kiến nghị là chúng ta, ASEAN, chúng ta phải tiếp tục củng cố và nâng cao cái vai trò trung tâm của ASEAN. À, trong cái uh, cơ chế hợp tác ASEAN cộng và để, để giải quyết một cách có hiệu quả các cái uh, thách thức ở trong cái khu vực uh, đối với các cái đối tác của chúng ta. Thì tôi nghĩ vai trò trung tâm của ASEAN luôn luôn phải được củng cố và tăng cường. Thank you. Nazi, I'd, like to see, I'd like to see more leadership at the ASEAN Secretariat level. Uh, I think it needs to be better funded. I think it needs to be better empowered. Uh, and I think it needs to drive greater collaboration between ASEAN countries and also between the private sector uh, and governments. Thank you. We do have one minute for you, Deputy Prime Minister, if you want to <laughs> have the last word and uh, uh, with not, for not your ASEAN year. <laughs> thank you, Ibrimari. Not the last word, but, but I just <laughs> wanted to say it's been a very useful discussion. Um, and I just wanted to connect two of the points that were made, uh, one about sustainability and the other about youth. Uh, to be frank, my impression in us is that in ASEAN, uh, the whole sustainability agenda has been a very defensive one. It's about the rest of the world trying to badger uh, ASEAN countries to do what the rest of the world thinks right. It in reality is not about the rest of the world, it's about our own people. And I think if we can mobilize young people, startups, social enterprise, volunteers, young people using technology, they can shine a very different light on sustainability. It's first and foremost about our own people, and we do the right thing for our own people. We'll also be doing the right thing for the region as a whole and for the rest of the world. And I think young people, because of that mix of idealism and long-term thinking, 
uh, need to be much more in the lead on the whole sustainability issue. So I, I, I really thought that was a very useful set of points that were made. And uh, it also goes back to Nazar's first point, which is that it's also about protection of incumbents. Mm. And young people need to shine a light on that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, excellent discussion, excellent uh, interventions from the floor. I'm not going to summarize, but I, I was told that there's a three-point rule. <laughs> First point, I think we should not forget the basic agenda, which is about governance, including anti, uh, you know, in addressing corruption issues. That's an ongoing agenda, infrastructure issues, education and health. Second, partnerships uh, and in with the digital, in, in addressing the challenges, especially technological challenges, partnerships become uh, even more important. And third, I think inclusiveness. Uh, youth uh, being, you know, that is the future. How do we make sure that women and youth and girls are really, really going to be part of the ASEAN uh, community uh, moving ahead? And uh, I guess I had four. The, the last point was the, the point the pr Deputy Prime Minister made about the importance of ASEAN economic community. Given what's uh, happening in the world with uh, you know, the retreat from globalization, this is the time for ASEAN to be strong. This is the time for RCEP to be uh, really made uh, happen. And your point to the ASEAN Secretariat being made strengthened is very important too, about the institutional and the in, uh, institutions and the enablers that can make that happen. Thank you very much. And uh, a round of applause for our excellent panelists.